So last Wednesday, I asked you to suspend disbelief and bear with me as we worked our way through the Pareto system as a way of backing into the political theory of John Stuart Mill, which is going to be our subject today. Um, and I also promised you that a side benefit of, of Wednesday's lecture was you would get to, to learn everything you ever needed to know about neoclassical economics. That, in fact, is true. Um, everything you ever do in economics is basically derived from or built from those simple ideas that Pareto and Edgeworth put together. So um, it is indeed, I think, a side benefit of working through it. But now I'm, what I want to do today is integrate what we saw in the Pareto system and the remarks I made about Stevenson's emotivism in philosophy and come uh, into the central arguments in political theory that are informed by these mature Enlightenment ideas. And you're going to see why I talk about the mature Enlightenment with respect to Mill further on in today's lecture. Um, as you can see here, I talk about Mill as attempting to synthesize rights and utility. And you might think, well, OK, how is he going to do that? Some of you who know a little bit more about Mill may also think it's, it's odd that I have chosen his little essay called On Liberty for you to read uh, in, in explaining his utilitarianism, when in fact Mill wrote an essay on utilitarianism which I'm not having you read, although I'm certainly uh, I'm, I'm not prohibiting you from reading it. But I think that um, what you can see is that the synthesis of rights and utility can be approached from either end. And um, I'm going to approach it from the rights end, uh, at least initially. And then we'll worry about the utilitarian end of things later. Um, but I think Mill's basic view is whether you start to develop a fully satisfying conception of individual rights or whether you start to develop a fully sa satisfying conception of utilitarianism, you're going to end up incorporating the other one of those two into your account. Let me tell you a little bit about who John Stuart Mill was. Um, he was the son of James Mill who had been a contemporary of Jeremy Bentham's. Indeed, not only a contemporary, but actually a disciple of Jeremy Bentham's. And a true believer in Benthamite utilitarianism, including in the matter of the education of his son. Um, he was very uh, concerned to give his son the most efficient possible education in order to get him to achieve at the highest level. And so he was what we would today call homeschooled. Um, there were governesses and school teachers brought to his home. He never went to school. And indeed, he turned out to be an, a brilliant child. Uh, he was doing a, um, a differential calculus at a very young age. He was speaking Latin and Greek in his teens. Uh, he was just a, an astonishingly smart child. And so they... Um, ramped up his education at an incredible clip, with the result that by the age of 21, he actually had a nervous breakdown. He had no friends. He had no life. He was a miserable, brilliant nerd. Um, and he never entirely recovered from that experience, and nor did he ever quite absolve Bentham and his father's uh, single-mindedness um, from responsibility for doing that to him. Uh, and he was a somewhat pained and tortured person in late, later in life. I think he never quite shed the scars, but his, uh, his wife Harriet, who was a very interesting intellectual in her own right, uh, and wrote much of Mill's famous essay that, that appeared over his name uh, on the subjugation of women, and indeed, some Mill scholars think that Harriet also had a big role in the writing of On Liberty, but that's more uh, speculative. Um, so he never quite got over that early uh, 
shock and awe utilitarian education, um, but he also never entirely shed the commitment to the idea that utilitarianism is the best system for thinking about politics. Uh, at one point he says, I, I do endorse utilitarianism, but only in the largest sense of man as a progressive being. And we'll come back to what that might mean uh, as we proceed. So Mill does have one um, useful characteristic in, in common with Bentham. I think it's the only one. As I said, that Bentham is one of these monomaniacal people, um, and what makes him useful to us is he takes an idea and runs with it to the absolute extreme, and that's useful um, because you can see uh, its assumptions in a, in a very sharp and stark light. Mill is somebody who's aware of the infinitely complex uh, nature of human existence and uh, is not a, a Johnny OneNote in the sense that uh, Bentham was. And you'll see this very quickly as we get into his argument. Nonetheless, he shares in common with Bentham um, the feature that he reduces his doctrine to a single paragraph. Just as Bentham did, it was the opening paragraph of his introduction to the principles of morals and legislation. With Mill, it comes about 12 pages in on the, on the Hackett edition that you're reading. He says, categorically, the object of this essay is to assert one very simple, simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely. This sounds quite unequivocal the dealings of society with the individual in the way of compulsion and control. Whether the means be used be the physical force in the form of legal penalties or the moral coercion of public op opinion. That principle is that the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection that the only purpose for which power can rightfully be exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. He cannot rightfully be compelled to do or to forbear because it will be better for him, because it will make him happier, because in the opinions of others to do so would be wise or even right. These are good reasons for remonstrating with him, or reasoning with him, or persuading him, or entreating him, but not for compelling him, or visiting him with any evil in case he do otherwise. To justify that, to, that is to justify compelling him, the conduct from which it's desired to deter him must be calculated to produce evil, must be calculated to produce evil to someone else. The only part of the conduct of anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. In the part which merely concerns himself, his independence is of right absolute. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. Anyone think they have any doubt about what he's saying? I mean, setting aside whether you agree with it. Seems, anyone think you, you feel pretty clear about what he's saying? Let's put up, clear about what, he, what he's saying, never mind whether we agree with it. Underst okay, well, only one person feels clear. Uh, who feels unclear about his, what he's saying? So we have one person who's clear, nobody who's unclear, and 136 undecided? Wow. I mean, isn't, isn't it clear? He's, as I said, I'm not asking you whether you agree. He's just saying, unless you harm somebody else, you've got to be left alone. And the state must, A, leave you alone, and B, stop anyone else who wants to interfere with you. Hearkening back to Bentham's point that uh, the law should stay the hand of a third party. Right? That's what he's saying here. Yeah? It's not rocket science. It's, I mean, it's very direct. Okay, so that's what he's saying. 
you might say, well, okay. I mean, just to give you an example, he's saying, you know, um, if uh, one of you comes to me at the end of this course and says, I, Professor Shapiro, will you write me a letter because I want to go to law school? And I say, well, you know, I've come, come to know you and uh, you've got a lot of good qualities and skills, and, but you, you're just not, you are not a lawyer. Trust me. I've been around a long time. You should not go to law school. The appropriate answer, Mill would say, is, well, thank you for your opinion. I'm not asking you to tell me what to do. Uh, I, you know, I can plead with you. I can remonstrate with you. I can try and persuade you. But at the end of the day, if you, if you say, well, thank you very much, but I, I'm going to law school, uh, I run up at the end of, I shouldn't try to coerce you. And not only that, I, I shouldn't try and get others to put pressure on you, right? It's not, not only should you not be compelled, but we shouldn't try and coerce you with the, you know, the moral force of public opinion. We shouldn't start telling lawyer jokes uh, to make you feel bad, right? So we have to respect the autonomy of the individual. Complete opposite, at least going in, from where Bentham starts, right? And one of the things you should see from this, and you should, should be starting to go through your mind, um, is that there is a deep structural identity between Mill's harm principle and the Pareto principle that we discussed last time. I'll come back to that later. But there's a basic structural identity between those two things. Now you could say, okay, so Mill is saying respect everybody's rights. This is a strong theory of individual rights. Unless somebody's harming somebody else, they have to be left alone and the state has to make sure that they're going to be left alone. Fine, that's a theory of rights, but what does this have to do with utilitarianism? Right? How does Mill get from protecting freedom of the individual through this robust doctrine of individual rights to the notion that we're going to maximize the utility in society. Anyone have any idea? Anyone? Yeah. Yes, sir. Wait for the microphone. Does he argue that freedom leads to the highest level of pleasure? That uh, an individual pursuing, I guess, given that type of freedom would gain utility from that and thus maximizing that type of freedom but at an why? individual level. Why do we gain utility from freedom? Yeah, why, 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 does, why does, in Mel's mind, why does maximizing freedom also maximize utility? I mean, you're right. You're dead right. But there's, there's an intermediate step. What's the, yeah, okay, over here. According to Mill, only individual people can decide for themselves what makes them happy. According to Mill, only individuals can decide for themselves what makes them happy. That is also correct. Um, but there's still another step in this that I want us to focus on that neither of you has mentioned yet. Yeah. Maybe that individuals knowing their own desires will bargain with one another, um, using their freedom to, to gain the mutual maximum utility. Well, that's a very good point. And that, that is where the identity with the Pareto principle comes in. If you leave people alone, right, they will do what they want with themselves or not, or, or with others. And so what Mill's harm principle allows in politics is the sort of analog of what the Pareto principle, what we were calling Pareto superior in economics. That's also true, but it's not what I was looking for uh, right now. So there's no reason you should know that because uh, you can't read my mind. But there's another step. Think, think back to the big picture. The big picture is all these Enlightenment theories are committed both to the freedom of individual and to scientific truth. Right? Mill is an Enlightenment thinker of the first order. 
if you flip through your whole copy of On Liberty, you will see what is the longest chapter about? What is the longest chapter about? It's probably half the book. Freedom of thought and discussion, right. Freedom of speech. So why is freedom of speech so important? Because Mill thinks that is the path to the truth. Freedom of speech is the path to the truth. Now I want to spend a little bit of time on this because it's really important. It's really important for two reasons. The first is you're going to see a very different conception of science in forming Mill's work. Remember back to our discussion of the early Enlightenment, of Hobbes, of Locke, of Bentham, that truth was equated with certainty. Remember they got the, early, the 17th century people had this weird root to this because it wasn't what we think of as a priori truths, but things that were a product of wills and all that, right? The early Enlightenment idea of science is to find certainty, right? Cartesian doubt, remember, is looking for propositions that cannot be doubted, things that can be known with certainty. Mill is a fallibilist. Mill has a much more modern conception of science, the one that you intuitively have, which says, first of all, that um, all knowledge is corrigible, all propositions uh, have to be evaluated by reference to evidence and the scientific method, and we could always be wrong in doing that, uh, in our attempts to do that. So uh, a very important move in the history of the philosophy of science in this regard was to move away from talking about what philosophers used, used the word verificationism, proving that a scientific theory is correct, and instead starting to talk about falsificationism, proving that it hasn't yet been falsified. And so any of you who takes a statistics course uh, in, in the social sciences will know what you have is a hypothesis, an empirical hypothesis, saying, you know, uh, high tax rates cause um, high tax rates lead to, to inflation. And you go and you'll, you'll test it against the evidence. And it, you'll have some other hypothesis that, that will be called the competing hypothesis, or the null hypothesis. And all you'll ever be able to say is that your, your hypothesis hasn't been shown to be false. You'll never know, you, you'll never know for certain that some other hypothesis couldn't do better. Okay, so false, this is falsificationism is the idea that would eventually become uh, associated with the, the philosopher Karl Popper, who we don't read in this course, but it's this idea that um, knowledge claims are corrigible, all our knowledge claims might be wrong, and the scientific attitude involves recognizing that and acting accordingly. So it's the mature enlightenment conception of science means you have to be committed to finding the truth as an ongoing quest. And this is really important for Mel. Okay? So freedom of speech is really important for Mel as a path to the truth. As the path to the truth. Now that's one reason it's important. The second is that Mill injects into a desirable political system the importance of argument, arguing. And this is going to come up again and again in the course, particularly in the last section when we get to democratic theory. When I say Mill talks about the importance of argument, this is very different from deliberation. It's not the idea that we should all get together and hold hands and 
sing kumbaya and see what we can agree about. That's the sort of deliberative ideal, right? Deliberation. Argument is, how many here have seen prime minister's questions on TV, right? That's argument, okay? Or crossfire, uh, the TV program, that's argument where people hurl the best criticisms they can come up with against the other side. It's, it's not surprisingly where Mill is often held to be responsible for the metaphor of the competition of ideas. These are two very different models of the role of speech in politics. Just to give you an example of what's at stake here, there's a lot of experimental work that's been done on, in, by social psychologists um, on this question. So suppose, suppose there's a field, and in the middle of the field there is a cow. And we're all standing around the field looking at the cow. And the question is, what does the cow weigh? And think about two ways of tackling this question. One would be that we all discuss, what, what do you think the cow weighs? What do you think it weighs? And we eventually reach some agreement upon what we think the cow weighs, and we go with that number. The second approach would be to say we don't talk to each other at all. Each of us looks at the cow and makes our own best judgment about what the cow weighs. We add them all up and divide it by the number of people. Who, which, which method do you think is more likely to get the weight of the cow accurate? How many people think the deliberative method? Hands up for the deliberative method. Okay, it looks like about a third of you. How many for the, the non-deliberative additive method? Okay, so you win two to one. Well, it turns out you're right. It turns out um, that the, the non-deliberative additive method is right, gets, to the, gets the answer right almost exactly, whereas the deliberative method goes all over the place. Now, there's lots of speculation about why. Now, what one, one reason could be, well, the trouble with the deliberative method is, you know, it, it's going to lead people to listen to strong personalities, or people who think they know more than they do. You know, Leonid there over there says, look, I, you know, I grew up on a farm. Don't tell me about cows. I know everything there is to know about cows. What do you people know? And I say that cow is where it weighs 1,500 pounds. You know, and then a lot of other people say, well, he did. He grew up on a farm. What do I know? And so maybe opinion gets swayed in that way. That's, that, that's one possible reason. Um, people may copy what other people say just because they, they, they don't know, et cetera. But for whatever reason, and we could speculate, and when we come to talk about deliberative democracy later, we'll go into it more. Um, I just wanted to flag this distinction that argument is not deliberation. Okay? And so um, when Mill talks about argument, it's, it's rather this idea that um, everybody makes their own independent judgment. Uh, he wants our, our capacity to make that judgment to be strengthened, but that's not the same thing as deliberation. He wants us to have our own individual robust judgments and trust them. Okay? That is, that is his ideal. And we should never ever kowtow to the opinions of others. This is not a deliberative model. And indeed, Mill gives us four reasons for thinking that freedom of speech is important. For one thing he says here, this, this is the point about fallibilism, he says, if any opinion is compelled to silence, that opinion, for all we might know, might be true. To deny that is to assume our infallibility. So science is not about certainty, it's not about faith, 
right? It's recognizing that whatever we say might be wrong. Secondly, though a silenced opinion be in error, it may and very commonly does contain a portion of the truth. And since the general or prevailing opinion on any subject is rarely or never the whole truth, it is only by the collision of adverse opinions. That's Prime Minister's questions. That is crossfire, the collision of adverse opinions. That the remainder of the truth has any chance of being supplied. Third, even if the received opinion be not only true but the whole truth, unless it is suffered to be and actually is vigorously and, and earnestly contested, it will, by most of those who receive it, be held in the manner of a prejudice, with little comprehension or feeling of its rational grounds. That is, you don't want to only get the right answer, you want to get the right answer for the right reason. If you copy somebody's math assignment when you can't do the problem, you have the right answer, but you haven't got the right answer for the right reason. And not only this, but fourthly, the meaning of the doctrine itself will be in danger of being lost or enfeebled and deprived of its vital effect on the character and conduct. The dogma of becoming a mere formal profession, inefficacious for good, but cumbering the ground and preventing the growth of any real and heartfelt conviction from reason or personal experience. So you can say that Mill is, in some ways, what we would think of today as a libertarian. He's got this idea of freedom of speech. We should all be left alone to do as we like without interference from the state, except when the state stops others from interfering with us. Right? What Nozick will later call the night watchman state of liberal theory, this negative freedom, standard libertarian view. On the other hand, he's also a kind of romantic individualist. Right? He sees individual human flourishing. Somebody said here, the path, the path to happiness, everybody knows their, their own sources of utility. Nobody can tell you what makes you happy. This is the link to Stevenson we were talking about last time. I can't tell you what should be in your utility function. I don't know. No interpersonal comparisons of utility. That's the link to Pareto. So you can see in all of these fields, this move to, it's not mere subjectivism, it's the uh, romantic celebration of subjectivism, right? The, the full flourishing of your potential can only happen if you are allowed total freedom of speech, of, under, of, of anything you want to do, so long as you don't harm others. And this is important not just for your own individual utility function, but also because that's how society learns the truth. And truth is going to be important for the pursuit of utility. You need these tough-minded Critic, we should all be in, you know, whereas for Locke we were all miniature gods who have maker's knowledge of our creation. For Locke, we're all mini, for, for Mill, we're all miniature scientists. We sh we've got to have the critical attitude, and we, you can't learn, get a critical attitude if you're, if you're copying other people's math. You have to be able to defend your reasoning to all comers. You have to stand there like Gordon Brown at question time and have people, you know, hurl counterexamples at you, not people who are trying to get your agreement. Okay, it's the combat of ideas, the, the clash of ideas. That's, the truth comes out as a byproduct of that, just as in the invisible hand theory of markets, the truth is a byproduct, uh, efficiency is a byproduct of lots of individual transactions. Right? So that, that is, uh, it's, that is the, the connection, if you like, between Mill's idea of the importance of each individual getting the truth for themselves and the Pareto principle. In both cases, it's an invisible hand explanation which says, as a byproduct of this, utilitarian efficiency is maximized. 
That's why the chapter on freedom of speech is central to this doctrine. Okay, so all well and good, you might say, but how many read the, to the end, the chapter on applications? It all starts to unravel, it seems, once we get to the chapter on applications. Here, Mill says, in many cases, an individual pursuing a leg legitimate object necessarily and therefore legitimately causes pain or loss to others, or intercepts a good which they had a reasonable hope of attaining. Such opposition of interest between individuals often arise from bad social institutions, but are unavoidable while those institutions last, and some would be unavoidable under any institutions. Whoever succeeds in an overcrowded profession, or in a competitive examination, whoever is preferred to another in any contest for an object which both desire, reaps benefit from the loss of others from their wasted exertion and disappointment. But it is by common admission better for the general interest of mankind that persons should pursue their objects undeterred by this sort of consequences. In other words, society admits no right, either legal or moral, in the disappointed competitors to impunity from this kind of suffering and feels called on to interfere only when means of success have employ been employed which is contrary to the general interest to permit, namely fraud or treachery and force. What's the problem with all of that? It's not exactly eloquent, but what, what, what is the, what's the problem there? Isn't, isn't there a problem? Maybe there's no problem. That's called a clue. <laughs> What's the problem? Yeah. According to this, couldn't you reason that something like the Holocaust was okay if it's in the general interest of mankind or any kind of... Yeah. I mean, it's a big problem, right? I mean, didn't he say earlier on that um, people can't be coerced into accepting results just because the majority believes it? And, then, and he went out of his way. He went out of his way to say whether it's the actions of the majority or the moral coercion of public opinion. But here he's saying, but it is by common admission better that we have competitive exams. Of course the people who don't get the job are harmed, but it's too bad. Seems like a contradiction, no? Give another example. Again, trade is a social act. Whoever undertakes to to sell any description of goods to the public does what affects the interests of other persons and society in general. And thus his conduct, in principle, comes within the jurisdiction of society. Accordingly, it was once held to be the duty of governments in all cases which were considered of importance to fix prices and regulate the process of manufacture. But it is now recognized, though not, love this passive voice, it is now recognized though not till after a long struggle that both the cheapness and the quality of commodities are more effectually provided for by leaving the producers and sellers perfectly free under the sole check of equal freedom to the buyers of supplanting themselves elsewhere. This is a so-called doctrine of free trade, which rests on grounds different from, though equally solid with, the principle of liberty asserted in this essay. Same problem, right? It is now recognized. By whom? Why should we believe that? And more importantly, aren't we supposed to be protected from the dominant view? Right? So free trade. We, you know, we think about the arguments we have today. This is a century later. The arguments we have about outsourcing. Yes, uh, 
They harm the interests of American workers it, when they move factories to Mexico. But Mill said, yeah, it's true, but you know, free trade's better. It's better from the standpoint of utilitarianism. Big problem, it seems. You think Mill was just actually not that smart? He didn't see this huge contradiction, sort of right the minute you start to apply this doctrine, it, it all just turns to sand? Anyone think there's a way out of this for Mill? Well, people have been struggling with this ever since he wrote it, because it does seem to be a big problem. But on the other hand, the allure of this rights utility synthesis is so great that people want to find a way to solve it. And I think this is how Mill thought about this. There's no contradiction at all. I think that Mill thinks in terms of a two-step test. Step one is, you say, of any proposed action. Is there going to be harm to somebody else? So, uh, smoking marijuana, or in more, I guess, contextually appropriate at the time, prohibition. This is a case that Mill considered uh, in, in what you read. If you, go, if you go to your room and you get paralytically drunk or you get stoned and you sleep it off, you're not harming anybody. So it's protected. So Mill was a libertarian in that sense. And he opposed prohibition, which was a very live issue uh, when he was writing. But there are a lot of activities where it's inevitable that there's going to be harm. You know, yes, it's true that protectionism harms some people, but any trade regime is going to harm some people, right? So, uh, I'm sorry, free trade harms American workers, but protectionism harms African workers or Indonesian workers, right? Whatever you do for a trade policy, they're gonna, there's going to be, somebody's going to be harmed. Or whatever system you have for giving away jobs in the civil service, whoever doesn't get the job's going to be harmed. If you have pure competition, uh, the people who don't get the highest scores are going to be harmed. Uh, if, you, if you have, you know, uh, job reservation for whites, as they had in South Africa, then um, blacks are not going to get the jobs. If you have affirmative action to re remedy past injustices um, in the Connecticut Fire Department, then um, the people who would otherwise have, have gotten the jobs are going to be harmed, as the court, Supreme Court said in, in uh, last year. So Mill's point is you first make an inquiry, is there a harm? If the answer is no, the action is self-regarding and it's protected. Free speech doesn't hurt anybody. That's why it's so important to protect it. Indeed, he wants to say the externalities of free speech are positive. Free speech doesn't hurt anybody. Drinking doesn't hurt anybody. Now, somebody, some of you might question that. You might say, well, if, you, if you, you go to a bar and you get paralytically drunk and you, and you then get behind the wheel of a car and you go home and you kill somebody, drinking does harm. What do you think Mill would say to that? I think Mill would say, well, that's a reason to penalized drunk driving, but not drinking, right? So I, th I think that's what he'd say uh, to that. But 
So the first step is you, you ask, is there a harm to others? If the answer is no, it's protected by the harm principle. If the answer is yes, there's a harm to others, then you make a utilitarian calculation as to what's best for society. So if there's a harm to others, then you make the utilitarian calculation. And that's why it's important to have good science. Because when you make the utilitarian calculation, you want to bring the best scientific knowledge to bear on making that calculation. He doesn't trust majority opinion, right? He wants to say, free trade is better than protectionism. We now know that as a matter of economic science when he was writing. If somebody could come along and show that there's something other than free trade, that would be even better, we, then we would pick that. Okay, so um, it's not the case that he wants to say this is, you know, infallible knowledge or known for all time, but for the moment, the best scientific judgment when I'm writing this book on liberty, Mill says, is that free trade maximizes utility. So step one, is there a harm? If no, it's protected. If yes, then you make the utilitarian calculation, and then it's important to have good science behind you, not majority opinion, right? And that's why freedom of speech is the pathway from liberty to utilitarian efficiency, and that's why all good things go together in Mill's account, and we can have this hunky-dory synthesis of rights and utility. Great, right? Now we're going to go more deeply into this question on Wednesday, whether it is all hunky-dory. Um, because, you know, I've said now, well, there's a two-step test for determining harm. And that makes sense, and it makes the apparent contradiction go away. And I think it is the best reconstruction of what Mill wanted to say, even though he could have said it more clearly if he had come out and done that. Um, nonetheless, there's still the question of who gets to decide what counts as a relevant harm. I said you do the first, the first stage, is there a harm? But just from the, the little example I gave of drunken driving and drinking, you can see that this might be problematic. One of the things I want to thank you to think about between now and Wednesday is some other examples, such as prostitution. Um, does that involve harm to others or not? Um, okay, we, I don't want to answer that now. Just think about it. I want to ask you that on Wednesday. <laughs>